Hello, everybody. Welcome back to technically another episode of Library of Arena, but at the same time, not really. Um, this is episode one of lore reading, credenza reading, whatever you would like to call it. And while it is technically Library of Arena, it, it's not really at the same time. So it's going to go into the playlist at the very end, but yeah, it's, I mean, it's not part of the Let's Play. But yeah, this is something that I'm going to be doing because I said I was going to do it and because I want to do it. Because I feel bad that, you know, I mean, I, I forget to read them almost all the time. And we're almost at the point now where reading them takes too long. Like the episodes are like an hour and 20 to two hours at the, as it is. There's not really much time to squeeze the lore reading into it as much as I might like. Um, so what we're going to do is instead just read them in a separate video, and that's going to be this video. So, there's a lot. I haven't exactly decided how I want to split these up. Part of me wants to say, okay, this one is going to be a video, this one's going to be a video, this one's going to be a video, and so on and so forth. But then that's going to mean, that's going to mean that videos like this are going to be like 40 minutes long. You know, that's an exaggeration. It'll probably be probably be like 20 minutes long. While this one will probably be like <laughs> 10 minutes long, maybe eight minutes long. I don't know. I'm for sure reading Canard today and I might do Urban Myth. And I think Urban Legend is going to be its own. So that's how that's how we're going to start. Uh, and with that, I mean, we're just going to jump right into it. Now, I know I have read these before, but we are going to read them again. We're going to read all of them again. Oh, and also, just a little bit before I actually get going, uh, I did a bunch of general invitations, and apparently there were a lot of people that we hadn't actually seen. Like, the Axe Gang exists, apparently, and these guys exist, apparently. I was just trying to find general invitations so that if I read these, I wouldn't have to go back and retcon and like make another video to include people we missed or something. But yeah, so that's gonna be talked about more in the actual Let's Play for today. But you know what? We're just gonna jump into it for real this time. Uh, so first we have Lenny's page from The Rats. Wanna hear a secret? This is kind of embarrassing, but I used to have a dream once, like Pete does now. Yeah, I know, I'm still younger than him with a long future ahead of me, but what can I do? Life's too rough for that. Others say that rats are a pathetic bunch who are too incompetent to join even the smallest syndicate, let alone a wing. Filthy losers who feed on junk and leftovers, not making any effort to change. Back when I was a young kid, I didn't like that. I thought I was better off than those rats, so I decided to get into an examinee town. Little did I know that I'd be the one that it'd be the one choice I'd regret the most. I begged and nagged at my parents, wanting to achieve that stupid dream. How'd it go, you ask? Seems just as stupid. Uh, seems you're just as stupid, aren't you? I wouldn't be hanging out with these folks if I made it, now would I? What I'm saying is, Jeremy won't do jack shit for you. They didn't even- they didn't end up here because they gave up trying. Hell, they wouldn't have set foot on this gutter in the first place if they had known what it takes to achieve their dreams. You get it now? Pete's a huge idiot. Yeah, nothing better for me than a whole episode of reading. <laughs> because that's my best thing- that's- that's my strong suit, right? Well, I've committed. Did you know? There's grades for each alley in the back streets. Funny, ain't it? Trash in a trash can are grading each other. The parts that are under the protection of a syndicate officer association are pretty safe. Sweepers can't raid those streets easily. Putting the people who live there in a different grade from those who don't, though, is pointless, honestly speaking. Sure, it's a bit safer over there, but we're talking about the back streets, get it? You know what's funnier? Even kids would group themselves according to what part of the streets they live in. And even shun the others whose clothes or manner didn't fit their turf style. I had no choice but to accept the sad truth. You're wondering how things were in the alleys I lived. Couldn't afford to pay protection fees to a syndicate, so the sweepers came down at night and collected most of my neighbors. I had to witness them take chunks of flesh out of my parents and brothers while they were still breathing. Don't pity me, though. My story ain't nothing special around here. Alright, next we have Pete's page. There's not a lot of peeps who hang around in the back streets alone. It's because that's just madness. Weak and dowdy folks got a band together to survive get into a small syndicate or anything and make a living somehow. Some ignorant fool makes a scene in the back streets and the, on their own. They're just making themselves a target as soon as they no, as others notice they're alone. That's why we move in groups. We're calling rats for a reason. We crawl around the darkened packs and jump at prey for the chance to bite them apart when we, when we spot one. 
So, you wondering if we rats have any dreams? Hmm, I guess belonging to a proper syndicate, if any. We're just too tacky and amateurish to be called one. Uh, we hate being bound to rules, so hell will freeze over before one of us joins an office. No rat I know would move to an examinee town and study for a wing interest exams. Those nerds at examinee towns ain't too different from rats like us. We're all dreaming silly dreams that'll never come true with our petty skills. An office, a wing, a syndicate, or whatever. I think it's an easy task to belong to a decent group. People just accept what they got and live on. But still, I wanted to have a dream. Alright, uh, next we're moving on to the Yoon's office fixers, starting with Finn. It's been a while, sis. Actually, I talked to you some time ago. By myself, of course. It sounds a bit lonely, but I'm fine. Today's not going to be the same as the, uh, as the days before. I have good news. I finally joined an office run by this guy named Yoon and officially became a fixer. You're proud to see your precious little, your little younger brother grow up and make it, aren't you? Isn't it cool? I told you there's no need to worry about me. Oh, about Yoon's office. I think it's a really nice place. No, I'm not lying. Our operator Yoon is a bit cold, but he teaches me a lot of things. There's also Eri, who's my senior. I've yet to be friends with her, but she seems like a good person too. For now, they're giving me small jobs like searching for lost cats. Maybe they're worried I'm too inexperienced to handle tougher stuff. Not really fancy, but if I start out with small tasks like this and work up slowly, I'm gonna be a great fixer one day, yeah? My heart is already pumping with excitement. When I become a proud and dashing fixer, I'll buy a nest migration ticket and get a nice new home for you. I could buy my gear at a workshop thanks to your help and all that. Though that's not all. You always looked after me, sis. It's kind of embarrassing to talk about this. Anyway, don't worry about me, and do the things you want to do. I know you were always too busy caring for me to pursue your own interests. You offered to give me a prosthetic body or even a minor procedure the last time we met, but I'm doing fine without any of that stuff. And you got money to earn, and you got money to earn for yourself. Hmm, I'm tired, so I'll be going now. I ran around the whole town chasing a cat all day. Night, sis. I hope we see each other again. Yeah, that's not happening. Uh, all right, next is Aries Page. You have a lot of things to prepare for before you can jump into the fixer business, starting with choosing equipment. You'll need, uh, you'll need clothes to protect your bodily accessories, etc. But before any of that, body augmentation comes first. There's no point in having masterful skills or fancy equipment if your body can't keep up, you know. And training hard isn't going to do it. There's a limit to training your body, and the fittest body is still no match for mechanical prosthetics or bionic organs. you got to be able to keep your body intact to do anything, so you're pretty much forced to spend a fortune on it. There's a ton of methods to enhance your body. Exoskeletons, bionic surgeries, nano tattoos, prosthetic body parts, you name it. Deciding what workshop tech to employ is up to the preference and purpose. Some would, uh, some would want insane muscular strength that could let them carry a power pole one-handed, and others would want ludicrous speed, quick enough to skip over multiple blocks in a split second. It's so diverse, I could go on forever. If you need any ability, they got you covered. The only hurdle is money. In the city, money is what gets you power. That's why the first thing we notice when we assess our foes is how much they spent on their bodies. Oh, of course. Some technologies patented by closed groups like certain syndicates or wings are hard to get your hands on even if you have all the cash in the world. Just look at me, though. It took a teensy little procedure for me to lift this humongous weapon with one hand. This is the kind of power you can get, you see. Body augmentation is more of a necessity than an option here these days, so you'll want to study up on that. You don't want to stay a weakling when everybody else is getting their augmentations now, do you? Alright, well, next is Yoon. Finn was bungling in many ways. He had no talent, and he refused to take body modification procedures. All he armed himself with was a tiny weapon. I didn't exactly dislike him, though. They say a delicate person like him is nothing short of pathetic here, but he had passion regardless, and he was going to be our colleague from now on. Besides, it's not too common to see such a passionate fellow in this grueling mess of a city. He was an interesting one. Then why did I exploit him? Exploit is a rather harsh word to describe it, if you ask me. A sloppy kid like him would have gotten killed anyway abducted in the back streets and fading away while witnessing his innards getting ripped from his body. And that's one of the tamer examples I could give. In this city, worse things are happening here and there on a daily basis. If he didn't die there, he could have faced a much more terrible fate somewhere else, isn't that right? Never mind, this is all but rationalization. Think what you want. Alright, and then we have, uh, a Yoon Office Fixer Page 1. AKA a nobody. The society of fixers is built entirely upon uh, meritocracy. I almost said mediocrity. The greater you are, the higher you can climb. On the other hand, if you don't have the capability, you should be thankful for any org that accepts you and stay low. Thing is, capability can mean many things. For some, it could be physical strength, and others might have a superior intellect. It seems kind of unfair to me that they make arbitrary evaluations of a concept that can be taken in so many different ways. Not that I think I have some hidden talent that deserves a better grade or anything, though. I do feel a little bit. Uh, I do feel a bit upset. 
but I think I'm at the right place. The jobs I usually do are looking for lost cats at night. You can tell how low my spot is, yeah? I'm not a huge fan of the jobs I'm doing right now, of course. I mean, sure, I wouldn't say no to some flashy requests. I just accepted to carry on with my life. All right, well, next is the Brotherhood of Iron, starting with Moe's page. I frankly don't recommend replacing your entire body with a machine, especially with a cheap one. Aside from basic issues such as vulnerability to damage and creaky noises, cheap prosthetic bodies compromise too much. You're basically giving up all the joys of life. Can you imagine? You can't taste anything when you eat delicious food, and you can't feel the softness and coziness of a good bed. You can't feel anything get stuck in your body, be it a piece of paper or a knife. The head remembers those feelings, but you can't experience them again. There are ways to overcome it, though. You could buy a desire stimulation chip and plug it into your brain, inject medications, or use other methods. They're just absurdly expensive. You're better off saving up for a more expensive prosthetic body if you really want your senses back. High-quality, pricey bodies come with the sensory organs. As I always say, it's all about money in this world. Alright, Constus Page. What's your favorite food? That's a question I used to ask when I still had a human body. I love, love eating. Talking about food was a huge delight for me. We would share each other's tastes and preferences, and sometimes head to a restaurant for a meal just like that. But now, my body's a machine, as you can see. I can't taste anything anymore. Thanks for pointing that out. Mo told me to stop dreaming about it. I still want to try more delicious foods, though. Hot and flavorful, spicy and sweet, stuff like that. I guess this body is too cheap to restrain delusional thoughts like this. If we get more money and change our bodies to new ones, then maybe I'll be able to stop these thoughts from getting in the way of my work. Alright, and finally, we have Arnold's page. The city consists of 25 nests and 25 districts in the back streets that surround those nests, and countless offices and syndicates reside in the back streets. You know what's a surefire way for a syndicate to make a name for itself among all these competitors? The simplest method is office raiding. You literally storm into an office and wreak havoc on it. You never know who will be the winner until you fight. You could stop at a good beating and one side surrendering, but some syndicates raid offices out of pure boredom and kill everyone. Each syndicate has its own way of operation. It goes without saying that the syndicate has more fame to gain out of raiding a high-grade office filled with, some, with seasoned fixers. So the offices have to stay sharp at all times. But you'll also have to watch it. If you misjudge your opponents, you'll end up dead before you can try anything. Okay. Book office, starting with McCullen. And we are going to do Urban Myth as well, and that's going to be it for this episode. It's not entirely impossible for a syndicate member to engage in fixer work or vice versa. It's a pretty common occurrence, actually. If you have the skills to back yourself up, multiple organizations will make sweet offers to recruit you. What matters the most here is the relationships you've built. Your fate depends on the things you've done, or karma in other words. Wait and start out as fixers at the beginning. No, we were in fact a part of a homicidal syndicate. Just see how intimidating we look. We used to murder for hi we used to be murder for hire in District 23. It was a small syndicate ran by Naoki, I, and a few others. But our influence started to expand bit by bit since the young and talented tie-in joined us. Our current boss was originally the representative of an office we raided. They visited us once they heard we... They visited us... Oh my god. They visited us once they heard that we shredded their fixers brutally and hung their ragged corpses on the streets like scarecrows. That they'll need people like us. I thought they were just freaky with weird tastes, but looking back, now I get why they chose us. It's a strategy. Each office does all kinds of sensational stunts to attract the attention of potential clients in this oversaturated market. They hold radical events such as pay for one request, get one free group weapons into different grades and offer a free exchange for one of their most expensive ones, and the gullible clients fall for it. They don't know how much more than they don't know how much more that one plus one deal actually costs, or how it has limitations on the grades of requests you can make. They don't bother looking up the up to check if the top grade weapons are in fact used ones. It seems our boss didn't want to add the lies to this in industry that's already filled with oh, oh my god, that's already full of filthy schemes. But they still had to catch people's eyes somehow, and this is the result. Hire guys like us and proudly advertise it. Fixers from a former killer syndicate that will tear things up for you. You can count on us. Hang up a slogan like this, people get hooked. If that suits their taste, that is. Alright. Next is tie-in. How's my new weapon? Isn't it sick? Unico is the go-to workshop brand for ready-made bionic weapons and equipment. The prices are pretty reasonable compared to most procedures and workshop weapons, too. On top of superb performance, you can replace or attach them easily without having to worry about allergies. So it's pretty damn handy, you see. Oh, bionic equipment is pretty simple. It's like a weapon you attach to your body. It's not at all scary or dangerous, though it could feel a bit awkward when you use it for the first time. In my case, I accidentally ripped Naoki's clothes while walking by and cut my own cheek and when I flailed it out of frustration. But now that I've gotten used to it, I feel as if I have three hands. If you have trouble finding the perfect procedure or weapon for you, 
try bionic equipment. I guarantee it's good. All right, now we have Nauki. There's a huge variety of workshops, as diverse and si as diverse as syndicates and fixers are. Weapons need individuality to stand out in this day and age. Old-fashioned swords or guns won't stand a chance against modern weapons loaded with new technology, I bet. From cheap and common gear to bionic equipment like the one Tyin's using, to equipment with ridiculous abilities that's almost indistinguishable from magic. Don't get too hyped, though. More options means you need to be more cautious about choosing the right one for you. If you had the time and money, you could buy them all and test them out at your leisure. But we have neither, do we? Don't just buy the things others recommend without doing your own research, though. That's one of the stupidest things you could do. It might fit them, but that doesn't necessarily mean you'll have a good time with it. Still confident that you can wield them well? Get real, buddy. Workshop equipment is not your average weaponry. So before you choose your weapon, observe others carefully. See if any workshop products might suit you. Having keen eyes is all part of our skills. Guess why people choose us in our office out of all the tough fixers out there. Alright, Hook Office Fixer, page one. Back when we were still part of the killer syndicate, we got a client asking us to hunt some crazed syndicate. They were shaking like a drenched rat as they came in. I suppose they were scared of places like this. They asked us to catch the wicked criminals kidnapping people in the parts of the streets they live in. We had one question, though. It's nice that they're giving us a job, but why ask a syndicate like ours instead of going to the Zwei or other offices that are better suited for handling public safety issues? And they said they did try to request an office at first with the money raised by the neighbors, but then the office asked for a ridiculous sum of money, claiming that there's much preparation that they need to take before they can uproot a whole syndicate. The poor fellow begged for help, but the office personnel didn't even flinch. Well, money's the only thing that gets fixers moving, so that's understandable. And I think their friend recommended us to them while they were looking for another way, if I remember it right. Introduced us as a trustworthy syndicate, so they came all the way to our hideout. Trustworthy syndicate? It's a shame, really. I can still remember the client's head staring daggers at me, hanging from the top of a power pole. The syndicate paid us more cash, what can I do about it? They don't write official contracts or anything, so the highest bidder gets our favor. No use glaring at me like that, pal. We were told by our new client to hang the heads up and guts out in the streets to make an example of them. Those sick fucks even used some kind of singularity to keep them alive. Poor bastard. Should have requested an office in the first place somehow. Alright, we've got Urban Myth, uh, and then I think we're gonna call it, it's already 20 minutes. I did not know it was gonna take this long, and that's why I'm saying, that's why I'm saying, like, some of these are gonna take so long. I mean, look, look how many there are, look. Alright, we've got Jack's Page. Our usual source of cooking ingredients are syndicates specializing in butchery. The kinds of meats they treat and how they process it differs for each syndicate, so you should pick your, care your caterer carefully. Our meat pie bistro used to frequently trade with the musicians of Bremen and Little Piggies. The musicians of Bremen provided large quantities of meat, though it wasn't exactly the freshest. Shattered chips of bones were often in the meat, and the mixture of a different type would create an odd flavor. Still, it was a reliable supplier of ingredients all in all. Outside of special occasions, we'd use them for making experimental dishes or sausages. Oh, speaking of, sausages are made from a mix of several different kinds of meat. You could even find a rat inside at times. Anyway, we rarely sold the dishes made out of their meat other than the sausages. They'd never treat their meat nicely before handing it to us. The meat from Little Mi from little Piggies is pricey. It comes in small quantities, but its quality is good. We even got the highest grade meat sometimes if we were... <laughs> highest grade meat sometimes if we were lucky. Just looking at the meat from Little Piggies fills me with ideas about how to cook it and make my mouth water. That's how appealing the meat looks. But the price is rather heavy, so we only use it for important dishes or food we serve to customers. But both syndicates suddenly said they're no longer selling ingredients for some reason, so now Pierre and I have to pioneer a new supply chain on our own. I don't think this is all too bad, though. I enjoy working with Pierre a lot. Alright, well, speaking of Pierre, next is Pierre. Most cooks who live here have the same dream, becoming one of the eight chefs. They're the people who pursue the ultimate delicacy. Their way of cooking will... Uh, their way of cooking will give you a thrill just hearing about it. You don't feel it? You don't feel it? No, no. I'm sure you can feel it inside. I sound crazy. Ah, listen up, you stubborn square. This is why I can't talk with people whose brains are too old. They taste bad, too. There's a limit to the flavors people can draw forth. The height of taste the human tongue can feel isn't as impressive as you might think, really. The most delicious food doesn't come close to sending chills down your spine. At most, it's just good enough to make your eyes spin. And the food you guys casually eat going, mmm, tasty, are way, 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 way below that. So many chefs so many chefs gathered round one time, pondering what to do to pursue a taste beyond this limit. And then inspiration struck all of them at the same time like lightning. What if they sublimated what if they sublimated the experience into taste? Something beyond what the tongue can feel. You know, they say the presentation of food adds to its taste, right? What if the whole process of cooking could be tasted? 
They performed several experiments in an attempt to make that dream come true. So? What do you mean, so? I wouldn't be trying so hard if there was an end to the delicacy. All the chefs are continuing their research to this day, seeking more stimulating flavors. And I just want to be as good as the stain on their apron, at least. Alright, well, next is Backstreet's Butcher, page 1. District 23 is the street of flavor. Everything is permitted in the, in the pursuit of making delicious dishes, even dismembering humans. Isn't that exciting? The guests walked into the restaurant for a meal, but then the chef fell in love with them. They had the perfect amount of tenderness and girth. The chef pulled out a knife, and the guest ended up on a plate. You'll become the food you appreciate one day, and others will appreciate what you've become. It's a common story often told in these streets. Well, if you really, be if you really become the main character of one of those, be honored. That means the chef saw you as excellent meat. Hmm? This is one of the best compliments you can hear in District 23. The more you know. Alright, and then finally, for Pierre's Bistro, we have Backstreet Butcher, page 2. Butchering a human is a lot simpler than butchering other animals. Most of them are smaller than us, which means we can subdue them right away if they try to resist. Oh, I'm not saying you necessarily have to be taller to be a... have to be tall to be a butcher, so don't get discouraged. Anyway, humans can be a bit noisy, but they're very handy to deal with overall, since there's little to worry about compared to other meats. Besides the, uh, the eight chefs, for them, the human... For them, humans... Oh my god. For them, human meat is the one and only ingredient that matches their pursuit. Some buzz about how the process of cooking should be part of the flavor. You can't do that with any other meat, so you better watch it. If you dare wander this part of the town, your destination might end up being a dining table. Alright, well, we're on to Streetlight Office, and then after this, we are done with this episode. So let's kick it off with Mars Page. My mother was a fixer with a high grade that every one of my peers would dream of reaching. She was the envy of all. A radiant individual who received endless supplies of various expensive equipment and garnered constant recruit offers from other offices. Does that mean I have a safe, comfortable childhood under the care and wealth of such a wonderful person? Had that been the case, I would have earned a position in one of the wings already. Being the son of a high rank fixer, I was often targeted by syndicates opposing her. My mother's acquaintances held high expectations for me. At first, I was okay with their expectations. I was already dreaming to follow the path of my mother. In fact, I was hoping to live up to it and hear compliments such as, I knew you could make it, from others. Yes, I'm going to become a great fixer just like my mother. Then she'll be proud of me one day, right? She'll proudly say, that's my boy, in front of others. I studied hard day after day, taking no breaks in between. Countless times I held my sword with a strong resolve. Many days I spent weeping alone. Even if I faced setbacks and failures, I believed I could overcome them and stand strong like the protagonist of a movie, as if I could actually become someone great. But in the end, I grew into an ordinary aspiring fixer, and I learned that, it was only an av that I was only an average person with no talent to show off. When I entered an ordinary office with my ordinary capabilities, my mother seemed very glad to hear the news. She said an associate office for the Zawai is a good start, and I'll certainly be able to become successful if I work my way up slowly. However, I was greatly disappointed in myself. I couldn't look my mother in the eyes until I said my final goodbyes and left the house. Alright, next is Lulu. Oh crap. Another day without work. Fantastic. There's gotta be some case for us to take care of, like fly tipping or something. I'm gonna forget how to move at this rate. If I told my friends about this, they're so gonna want... Uh, they're so gonna whine like, well, isn't it a good thing that you have a lot of free time? Or, you're well off. We're about to starve from the lack of requests. Those dummies. Think about it for a moment. You need results to promote to a better fixer grade and see some growth in your office, right? And that's gonna lead to higher income for us. For now, I'm working with my boss son in some dork shaped like a ball of rice cake. But things could be better than this in the future, yeah? Not like I have problems with my coworkers. I'm talking about stuff like weapons and office interior. You know, those kinds of things. You get what I mean. I do bicker with Mars and snap at him often, yes, but that doesn't mean I hate him. Saint and Mars are both precious colleagues to me. Though, yeah, I know what you're about to say. If fixers develop private feelings for each other, it could be much harder to bear whatever happens down the line. I know what I'm doing is stupid. I have wits, unlike Mr. Rice Cake Face. But we're humans. It's just something that can't be helped. How could we strictly detach ourselves from one another and focus on work? I tried acting nonchalant. I did, but I guess I can't do it. Don said he feels the same. Gotta envy Marge for being cool-headed all the time. Alright, now we got Lulu's friend, page one. The peacekeeping office provides protection for requested territories for a certain period of time. Lulu's is one of those offices. What are they protecting against, you ask? The city, obviously. What I'm saying is, their job is to keep the area safe from all sorts of happenings and incidents that occur in the city. Of course, there won't be much to do if the area is too small or peaceful. But man, 
Compared to us who have to wait indefinitely for someone to make a request, Lulu's get living a good life. At least she does something. They don't have to worry about starving to death even if they don't get requests. Alright, Lulu's friend, page three. As her friend, it's unfortunate that Lulu is struck with grief. I don't have any tears to shed for her, though. I've got my share of rough experiences. I'm not just sharing it with others. Well, I did say I'll help her out, but the truth is, my office figured that we could find plenty of valuable loot in the library. And that's pretty tempting. The other one is probably thinking the same as me. Hey, what dummy would actually head to a dangerous place motivated purely by a friend's sob story? That kind of intimate and deep relationship is long gone from this world, especially in this business. That's why I can't understand Lulu. Sure, let's say that her colleague died out there. Even then, she should be valuing her own life, shouldn't she? She can be so stupid at times. Well, I have to go in with I have to go in with her anyway. All right, finally we have San's page. An associate office is one that is in a cooperative relationship with one of the associations. The advantage of this designation is that its fixtures will not have to worry about starving, since they're paid a stable salary, and that the office simply has to handle tasks given by the association with proficiency, rather than having to deal with clients and accept their own requests as ordinary offices do. Spending days without any incidents happening in the area designated for peacekeeping can be admittedly boring, though it's a blessing to have such a peaceful day in the city. I was grateful to have such serenity each day, reasoning with Lulu's occasional complaint. Is boredom the only downside of being an associate office? That's not quite true, because we're under the direct command of the association, but forced to take on any undesirable tasks they give, even if it carries the risk of wiping out the office. I can't blame the association, so I only have, my, I only have myself to fault for failing to save my guys. Well, there you have it. There is Canard and Urban Myth, and we will be doing Urban Legend next, and probably Urban Plague on its own. Because there are just so many to read. So, yeah. Thank you all for stopping by for this lore episode. Um, fun times. Fun times for sure. Uh, I don't know when this is going to go up. It's definitely not going to go up today. It'll probably go up, if I had to guess, Saturday. I think I'll have this one and... Also, Urban... I think it's Urban Plague? Urban Legend. I'll have this and Urban Legend up Saturday. So, expect to see that then. I say, as I continue to record this video. You know what? Uh, thank you all for watching. I hope that you enjoyed this episode. If you did, leave a thumbs up. If you didn't, leave a thumbs down. If you'd like to see more, consider subscribing. I upload daily at 2 o'clock and 3 o'clock Eastern Time. As always, I hope that you all have a fantastic rest of your day. And I will see you all in the next episode. So long, everybody.